Hi, and welcome to the Tomato Timer, a podcast about learning to learn. I'm Zubair from Xenos, and I'm tuning in live with experts from around the world, asking your questions and hearing their stories. All before the timer goes off. 24 minutes and 39 seconds to go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 11 of the Tomato Timer. We are continuing with the STEM career series, and today we have with us another STEM ambassador, Alana Green. She is a digital and technical solutions degree apprentice. Alana, it's so good to have you. Could you just tell us a little bit more about what you do? Uh, yeah, so I work for BT and I'm a degree apprentice in digital and technical solutions. Mm -hmm. So what that entails is we work on the network that kind of holds our um, TV services together. So um, yeah, we hold that infrastructure and like in my job role, I have to work on that network, making sure it's stable and new services are integrated. Amazing. So before we kind of get into the kind of technical bits of your degree, I want you to understand a bit more about the apprenticeship system that is common in the UK um, and across Europe as well, but probably not heard of as much to international students like us. So can you tell us a bit more about that? So um, an apprenticeship is essentially where you learn and earn at the same time. So you have your studies, but you also are integrated into the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, and it starts from different levels. So you have from like level three, which is typically like um, lower qualifications all the way up until degree. Um, and they're essentially yeah, just qualifications while you're in the workplace. So you're getting that real life work experience as well as um, getting your learning and your accreditation. So at the end of this, would you be able to, would you get a, like a degree as well as all the experience that you've had as well? Yep. So I'll be working to a BSc in digital and technical solutions. So it's the same degree as if you was to go to uni, mm. um, exactly the same. So yeah, you'll come out with a degree and a job at the end of it as well. Definitely something that I hadn't heard about until I actually got here. And I'm like, whoa, this is something so cool, especially because I'm not sure how your experience has been, but compared to going into a very academic world some people aren't always suited to that what, what, what did you think um did you have friends at universities and what's the what's the difference been like in your experience so a lot of my family members went to university um so i kind of saw how they like handled their workload um, and how they did it which was quite challenging um as they had to work as well as like a work a part-time job to fund their uni um so yeah and going into an apprenticeship i kind of saw um, the benefits straight away as I didn't have that stress of having to actively look for another job whilst trying to study as well. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so so you told us a little bit about kind of managing the television stuff and uh, just give us a little, more, a little bit more about like BT is one of the biggest networks here in the UK. Um, what other areas are you involved with uh, during your time and not just now but before as well as you kind of started off? So um, I work in the TV space but we, I've also worked on the BT Sport app so which is more like software based whereas now I'm more network based mm. um, but yeah BT they do a range of stuff so it could like do things such as HR, business management, um, cyber security, there's just a loads of range and where with my apprenticeship is quite good as we get to move around. So although I am TV based, I have seen a snippet of all these different areas yeah. um, within the apprenticeship and within my three years that I've worked here. So I've worked here for three years and yeah, I've worked on a lot of projects and seen a wide range of things around the business. That's amazing. Um, and so you, you said that kind of it was that perspective of seeing your family and friends around you who, who are struggling with managing the university degree and, and funding it as well. Um, when did you realize that this was the option you're going to go for? Was it at school itself? Was how Who influenced you? Yes, yeah, so it was in sixth form when I kind of decided that I wanted to pursue an apprenticeship. I did um, actually accept an offer for university, but during like the last couple of months of sixth form, I realised, yeah, this is not really uh -huh. what I want to do. Um, my brother previously done completed an apprenticeship in a completely different field. Um, however, I saw how well the outcome of it since he finished his apprenticeship in comparison to my sister who did the university and kind of struggled after university to find a job yeah um so I thought I'll just go down the apprenticeship route and also I'm more of a practical learner um 
So I thought this would be better for and more suited for myself. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and so, yes, um, last week we had uh, a guest who was kind of in a similar position as you in the sense that he also wanted to get that real world experience. And his option was choosing kind of like a sandwich here. So he was doing work experience uh, between his university degree. What are your thoughts on that? Is that also a good option to pursue? Yeah, 100%. I think just any real life experience is good, whether it is work experience or just an after school um, curriculum, curricular activity. I think as long as you're immersing yourself and you're willing to learn and willing to gain new skills, I think anything is worth it. But just, yeah, getting as kind of a leap and a jump into the industry that you're working in so you can actually see it for yourself how it is. I think it will always be beneficial. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so we have a few more like kind of technical questions. Um, so what are the intricacies of media network management? And is there any kind of incident, um, especially because I imagine uh, with hundreds of thousands and millions of people on a network, things can go horribly wrong as well. Is there any incident that you remember that kind of is memorable for you? Um, so I don't actually work on managing the network as such. We have a special team that are in there 24 um, seven. Okay. But we, as yeah. apprentices, we kind of like hear stories. And one of the, I think it was my second year of the apprenticeship. Um, they were on ITV because we manage, we don't just manage BT services. We manage like BBC and ITV. Yeah. Um, they must have been talking about conspiracy theories on one of like the Good Morning <laughs> yeah. Britain ep- um, programs. Um, uh, uh, ITV actually went down for like a couple number of seconds and everyone was like oh my gosh it's the government cutting it off <laughs> but um it was just something like in the background that um yeah it wasn't directly BT's fault but it was like one of the components that they worked with so another team that BT worked with that something went wrong which took down ITV for like five seconds but yeah it was all over the news that the government were hacking gosh. the TV because they were talking about conspiracy so that was quite funny um <laughs> management issue so yeah so um that that is pretty cool um what about like uh now that you've kind of got into your third year what does it look like from now um are you going to be getting getting out with a bsc would you be pursuing your job with bt further or are you going to be looking at some other opportunities I definitely want to stay in BT for another couple of years just to explore more of the areas as it is so wide. And I feel like it's great stepping stones into such a big industry and such a big field. Um, So I definitely want to pursue a bigger career with BT and potentially um, just climb up the ladder and see how far I can progress within this profession Mm -hmm. um, and see what options are available for me. Um, but yeah, there are, are a lot of similar companies as well that do similar things to BT. Um, but yeah, I do feel like BT is a great stepping stone just to get head like get a head start and see where it can take me. Absolutely. Um, and so we're also trying to kind of think about like as students, we're considering kind of A level options. Did any of that kind of um, it's it's just because um, hearing your kind of your role and title at the start was kind of quite intimidating it was like so yeah. specific right um it probably hadn't heard it before so how does that like how does that come about um and how do you get to be so precise um like i'm i'm you've obviously went straight from school straight into this kind of degree how did that what was that process for you and if we were to even if it wasn't as specific what sort of kind of a level choices should we be, we be making to kind of end up in a place like you or similar places so for my A levels, I took a completely different route. I done like mostly humanities, so I done English geography and English literature. And now I'm, now I'm in tech, so it's literally a 360. Um, I've done nothing to do with tech before I started this role, mm-hmm. um, but it was just that I wanted to challenge myself. I found that the courses I took in A levels, I couldn't really see myself pursuing yeah. um, pursuing a career in it. And I did kind of have that thing like, oh, is it a bit too late to switch now? Like, I've already chose my A-levels. I've studied two years to get to where I am. And now I'm going to do a completely U-turn and learn something new. But um, I just don't drive. I just dive straight into it, I guess. And mm-hmm. with an apprenticeship or any new skill that you take up, whether it be a new university 
degree to what you're doing now or a new A level to GCSE, I think it's all just about um, willingness. So like if you're willing to learn and you're willing to learn these skills, I think that's where it comes from. So yeah, I literally done a complete U-turn. I didn't have any prior skills. So yeah. How did that, how did that work in terms of um, kind of the, the technical knowledge? How were you able to, um, especially coming from a humanities background, was there any kind of um, coding languages that you needed to understand quicker or or just kind of the whole, you know, I imagine system architecture and all the kind of stuff involved in that on that front? So there were lots of loads of new skills that I had to learn. Um, I wouldn't say quite quickly as um, everyone in the workplace, well, they're really understanding and they have come from like similar backgrounds. So a lot of people in BT have been apprentices before. So they know like to kind of go slower with people and just take them over things. So where we have our study days, we have a study day every week. Okay. Um, so I would just take this upon myself to learn new skills so I could get up to scratch. Mm. But yeah, also in university, they kind of started from scratch as well, especially with like coding and stuff. Um, so it was quite nice as we were all on similar pages. Um, so I didn't feel like I was behind. But when I did feel like I was behind, I would just kind of take it upon myself to learn it a bit more. So again, yeah, that comes from like willingness to learn, I guess. So tell us a bit more about those study days. Is it um, so is it within the organization? All the apprentices uh, have that kind of opportunity. And uh, do you get like instructors or lecturers in as well? Um, so, yeah, with study days, we have this once a week, which lies on a Friday um, just for my specific building. However, with the university mm-hmm. side and like the studying side, we go to uni about once every six weeks, I want to say. And we'd go for a week. Mm-hmm. So a week straight out of work, we'll go for a week straight. We actually go to university. So it's um, university in Greenwich. It's called Ravensbourne. So, um, yeah, it's in London. Mm. I've been close. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, we yeah. go there for once a week, every six weeks. And, yeah, so we'll have lectures from the uni giving us lectures for a week straight. Um, and then, yeah, we all get assignments and, like, yeah, tasks like, like every other uni student. And we have deadlines to put that in. We also have tests as well. But, yeah, so we go for a week every six weeks, but we also have a study day every Friday. And um, that's kind of how it's broken up of our study and, and working. Amazing. And so would you be finishing your BSc in the same time period as as any other uni student? So it drags on a bit longer as obviously we're kind of part time. So my course is four years. So whereas um, if someone was to take this going straight to uni, theirs would only be three years. Mine's just a year added on. So it's four years. So next year I will graduate. Yeah. Yeah. My whole uni scheme. Amazing. But like, it sounds like a very well put together system as well. Uh, did you, did you ever feel like it was, it was challenging to uh, balance both things or were you happy in the way that um, both the study and the work aspects were balanced for you? For me personally, I do feel like um, it was balanced very well. I'm quite an organized person as such. So I will have like I'll write a timetable for when I need to do certain things. But um, yeah, everyone, as I said, everyone in the organisation is very understanding. So if I did feel like I needed an extra day to study or I did needed a little extra help, um, they would kind of cater to that. So they might be like, OK, Alana, on this day you can have two hours to do this and go away and just like sit in a meeting room and go through your studies as opposed to working within the team. So if you do feel like you're not up to scratch, there is people you can talk to mm. to like kind of um, cater for you. So cater your studying and workload for you. But generally, generally it is balanced very well. Um, and my manager was actually an apprentice as well. So she understands how this works, which is always good. That's always a good idea. Yeah. It probably empathise with you really well. Yeah. Um, and do you, um, I, I, I probably have a bit of an answer for this as well, but is your job uh, very sitting and uh, not practical or what would you describe it as? Just to be fair, so um, it depends what area you're in. So right now I'm in a team the implementation team which um, is a bit of both so I can actually go out into sites and install kit 
um, or I might be behind a desk um, working on a diagram. So it is a bit of a reactive job. It depends what comes through, so what projects you're working on. So you might may find yourself behind a desk for six months or you may find yourself mm. up on your feet for six months. So it literally depends what area you're working in. Some of it is more desk-based, some of it is more going out onto the fields and working on things. Um, so literally it all depends. So I would say it's 50-50. It's a bit of both. Okay, so I was. Uh, that's actually pretty cool. I didn't realize there was actual full practical element to your work, but um, I wanted to kind of like have your further thoughts on on this idea that w one of the issues that I, I I personally have faced at university is that you kind of are uh, are just close to and speaking to very pe people who are very from the same backgrounds as you, studying the same things as you, um, and so you don't have as much kind of. Um, how do I put it, you know, kind of like insightful or just kind of more uh, worldly discussions, but working in a huge organization like BT, where you're like coming across all these people with um, wealth of experiences and, and being in the real world, wh what would you, how does that feel um, kind of, and what, what sort of skills have you developed because of being in such a kind of um, big organizational environment? I feel like my communication skills have drastically improved and my confidence as before I was quite shy I didn't really like to network with um, a lot of people so I would kind of yeah just stick to my classmates and my friends whereas being in such a large organisation you're kind of forced to network with different people and also network, network with people outside your organisation um, networking is a good way obviously to learn more about industries learn more about different areas and just get yeah yeah that worldly feel for things um so one of yeah I, I would say communication and confidence is one of the main skills that I feel like have improved drastically and networking I thought I used to hate going to networking events um but now I always make sure I at least do some especially for those within STEM so um yeah not just sticking to my organization I make sure I go out to different STEM events so I can meet with people who have similar interests um, and are in a similar field and see their take on it and if they have any advice to give me yeah so actually um kind of talking about the fact that we were you were able to network and communicate and interact socially with so many people how has the well, we couldn't get away without speaking about the, the virus. How has that affected your, your work right, right now? Um, so, yeah, we've all been told to work from home. Um, so, yeah, I'm still working, but I'm just yeah, working from the comfort of my home. However, a lot of the jobs that I were working on have been put on hold as I would need to go into a site. And obviously, we're not allowed to travel unless it is essential. Um, but luckily, yeah. these projects, they weren't need to be delivered ASAP and they don't have any impact on the current existing infrastructure or any services that we see. So, um, yeah, a lot of my work have been put on hold. So my workload is quite small now. So during this time, I'm just taking it to like train and upskill myself. So I'm learning more skills, catching up on more uni work. Um, but yeah, a lot of people around the organisation still have a lot of work to do as our services are 24-7. Mm. However, the area I, I am in at the moment, um, my work is not crucial. So it is, yeah, a bit, a bit on the back burner. I see. And uh, what about um, uh, communications in general, not just your work, but how is how are telecommunication companies kind of handling the kind of onslaught of people on their phones and, and using kind of these kind of communication devices more and more, uh, although we were probably like addicted to our phones anyway, um, yeah. we, we, the, the kind of, uh, the amount of activity that's happening now is probably increased dramatically. BT's network is really resilient. So they always have like a backup, um, a backup network kind of to handle things like this. Um, so yeah, I haven't personally noticed any my my um, network going slow or anything so I think they are dealing very well with it um mm. I don't work in the mobile space but I have like read a things a few things that they're doing but yeah they seem very um their network seems very stable at the moment because we also deal with like 999 calls um so they have to make sure of course, yeah. the network is stable and able to handle a lot of capacity so I think they've just been doing like lots of capacity checks, ensuring that the network is stable and doing just regular checkups to make sure that everything is working fine. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I just wanted to have some of your like kind of thoughts and being in the in this industry, 
what what you're predicting um, moving forward with communications and and how we're how we'll be using our mobiles, especially with things like five G being developed. Um, what 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 that all means for the, the kind of the landscape of us communicating? I think it will just um, lead to more reliable and better capabilities of communication. So everything will be crisper, it'll be faster. You'll be able to do more. Like you'll be able to live stream with five G. Um, it will be a lot, yeah, a lot crisper. You wouldn't have any like delays or any latency issues. I know it is a bit of um, yeah, all up yeah. in the air five G at the moment. A lot of negative views towards that, but um, yeah, they have been testing it for a while and in different scenarios and seeing what impact it has. But I do think it will be beneficial to people. Um, obviously, at first, when things are integrated, there are a lot of negative views. But I do feel like as time goes on, people will warm up to that idea, and ho- well, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I think it will just be a lot better, a lot more reliable. You'll be able to do more stuff with it. It'll be faster. Um, will be less reliant on fixed broadband lines and fixed mm. internet lines. So yeah, just more portability and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, actually, it was um, pretty interesting that the the technology was developed in this little city in Finland. Or a lot of these kind of um, not just for, for like when we were on three G, four G, five G, six G. All these things have been are and actually like six G is being Im- implemented in this yeah. little city in in Finland. I. I surprisingly i got to visit it it's where nokia is based and and yeah and so in the middle of nowhere where you would think it's full full of snow all around you and it's icy and everything and um they have the best network connections in the world and it's weird because you walk out in london and somehow you'll you'll drop out with your 4g i'm like oh my gosh what's happening Uh, (laughs) yeah um but it's definitely very interesting and uh, there was a a bit more of an experimental question. Like, what do you think about um, communicating through holograms? And does that is that something <laughs> you're seeing coming up anytime soon? And I don't see why we won't be able to communicate through holograms. Like, loads of new ideas are, new ideas are always being pushed through, and um, communication companies are always want to be the first to experiment new things and try it. So I don't see why we we won't be having holograms in the future. I think it would be a cool interactive and immersive way to communicate in the future so um mm-hmm. I, yeah i don't see why not it wouldn't be implemented in the next few years i can't give a solid yes or no answer but um <laughs> i don't see why it wouldn't be and i don't see the problem with it mm. being implemented yeah so um i kind of want to circle back um just because we're getting closer to our, our finish time as well um just because you know, we were still students and it's it's been amazing hearing about all the technical bits as well. But what would, what were these like kind of um, being in a quite a unique educational experience? What would you say your main takeaways are and what would you be recommending to us? I think just put yourself in situations that you that are out of your comfort zone, um, network, go to networking events, do something that you enjoy and just follow your passion um and yeah don't be afraid of testing unknown waters like if you're not happy with what you're doing it's okay to try something new it's okay to immerse yourself in something and also yeah just learn new skills and be willing to learn I think it's all about mindset personally I think that would be my main takeaway is just having a positive mindset and being open to new things as before I was quite a sheltered person before joining BT and now that I've joined BT I've kind of opened up my mind a bit and allowed more things to enter which has given me more opportunities so yeah and and what about in particular like STEM um because there's a lot of um like sometimes it's a bit scary to imagine doing something so technical is there um anything specific that you've especially with your being ambassador for STEM as well, what what have you seen around you that's either motivated you to continue? And, and the fact that you, but by, by your A-levels, you weren't technically in, in specifically doing STEM subjects. So how does that, how did that affect you? I think what encourages me to do it is um, seeing there is part of a lack of representation within the STEM field, as I'm from an ethnic minority and um, from a low income background. I noticed there wasn't a lot of people like me in the field, which um, encourages me 
to be kind of an ambassador for STEM people and get more people involved and open more opportunities for people. It, even with my less technical background, I think it just takes one person to make a difference and inspire um, people. Absolutely. So that's kind of what encourages me. Um, and then with the technical aspect, I think I just ask a lot of questions. Um, I've always been told no question is a stupid question. So I just yeah, ask a lot of questions and make sure I understand things. And if I don't, yeah, just keep asking and researching. That's that's amazing. That's and I loved all your kind of pieces of advice, being organized, being t- stepping out of your comfort zone, uh, being confident and and always being willing to have this kind of positive mindset to learn skills. Did I, did I capture that, summarize that well enough? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. Thanks so much for being with us, Alana. It's, it's right at 25 minutes past so that we are um, done with our palm. Um, thank you for being with us. Uh, we appreciate it very much. And hopefully um, you've inspired some of our listeners today. Thanks for having me. Right. Thanks. Bye-bye. And that's another episode of The Tomato Timer. If you'd like to ask your questions and join us live next week, join the Xenos Discord server. The invite link is in the description. And to learn more about Xenos and how a bunch of students are on a mission of making quality education accessible to all, go to xenos.org. Bye for now.